Good afternoon uh, and good morning to those of you who join us from across the Atlantic. Uh, my name is Rainer Bauböck. I'm one of the four co-directors of the Global Citizenship Observatory, and I'm happy to welcome you to a Global Citizenship webinar on the topic of uh, citizenship and its link to voting rights. Uh, at Global Cit, we have been collecting data on both of these questions, citizenship laws and the franchise or electoral rights uh, for migrants. On the other hand, in this webinar, we want to bring together these two topics. We are aware that these are times when people have other worries on their mind. Uh, we don't know whether we are going to enter a new era of deglobalization of violent conflict, not just within, but also across states. Uh, but in spite of these dark uh, clouds on the horizons, uh, there is still a need for exploring how uh, democracies operate and work across borders. And the way how they incorporate immigrants into their democratic systems is one of these important topics that we are going to uh, discuss uh, this afternoon. We will consider the relation between citizenship laws and voting rights, both from an empirical perspective and a normative perspective. So we've subdivided this webinar into two rounds. The first round uh, will uh, present a new data set that uh, Global Citizenship uh, has uh, collected on the electoral rights of non-resident citizens and non-citizen residents. And this data set uh, and uh, the link between these rights and citizenship laws will be presented by two research associates, uh, Sebastian Ompieres and uh, Claudia Wegscheider. Uh, let me briefly introduce them before I introduce uh, the rest of the panel. Sebastian uh, is a dual PhD candidate at Poli uh, Politica of political science at uh, Universidad Diego Portales in Chile and in humanities at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And Claudia Wichaida is a PhD candidate at Oxford University in politics and international relations. And they've been working on this new data set for nearly a year by now. Um, and this will be the first comprehensive presentation. Uh, so you're witnessing a premiere. Uh, they will about have about 20 minutes for their presentation. Uh, then there is a chance to ask them questions. And for this, I ask you to use the Q&A function that you will find uh, on your screens at the lower end. Uh, so type up your questions. Unfortunately, it won't be possible to ask uh, live questions through the audio. And then we'll, we'll try to address these for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we'll come to the second part, which is uh, the, uh, the normative discussion, whether uh, citizenship and voting rights should be connected or rather disconnected. And for this, we have invited three panelists. All of them are frequent contributors to Global CIT. I'll introduce them also briefly now. This is Sandra Seibert, uh, who is a professor in political theory at Goethe University in Frankfurt, and who frequently writes on issues of EU citizenship. And there is Luis C. Pedrosa, who is a research professor at the Colegio de Mexico and has published an important book in 2019 uh, under the title of Citizenship Beyond Nationality, Immigrants' Rights to Vote Across the World. Uh, finally, last but certainly not least, there is Joachim Platter, professor of political science at Lucerne University. Uh, Joachim has written on the many different issues that I won't even try to sum up, both of methods uh, and, uh, and also on democratic theory. But in 2019, he was the lead author of a global citizenship debate on reciprocity-based transnational voting rights under the title of Let Me Vote in Your Country and I'll Let You Vote in Mine. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand it now over to uh, Sebastian and Claudia, uh, who will show you uh, briefly some slides on this new data set. Can you hear me? Hello, everyone. Uh, can you see the slides? Uh, 
Perfect. Well, we are going to talk about uh, me and Claudia. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, the nexus between citizenship laws and migrant electoral rights uh, using two relatively new global seed data set, as Reiner mentioned. Uh, the first is about the modes of acquisition and loss of citizenship uh, around the world. And the, the other that is uh, outgoing is on migrant electoral rights, uh, also with a uh, global scope. Uh, first, we are, well, I want to uh, show some insights on uh, only on, on the data set on migrant electoral rights. This is because this data set is not online yet. Uh, you can find the other data set regarding the citizenship loss on um, the link on on a link of global seed i'm going to to share uh the link uh in 10 minutes uh then i'm going to show some preliminary uh results or relations uh between citizenship laws uh some variables of the global seed uh data set and uh only with uh no resident citizens electoral rights Thereafter, my colleague uh, Claudia is going to show a similar uh, similar section um, or, or present a similar section with uh, focusing on uh, no citizen residence electoral rights. And finally, Claudia is going to briefly discuss some um, takeaways of this presentation. So. Inspired on the global seed data set on condition of electoral laws on uh, the ELEC LAO data set with Reiner and Claudia, we are doing or we are building a data set on migrant electoral rights with our global scope around uh, 100, and we include around 160 countries, um, but uh, we exclude uh, only close autocracies, uh, microstates with uh, less than uh, 250,000 uh, inhabitants. Uh, also dispute territories as West Sahara with effective uh, government. Uh, this is not the only uh, political innovation or uh, innovation regardless or as compared to the other uh, previous uh, global seed uh, data set, but also the temporal factor we intend to register migrant electoral rights uh, since the 60s up to 2020, accounting for uh, specific policies that affect um, the electoral rights of no resident citizens or no citizens uh, residents, uh, such in Albania, for example, uh, with a new enactment of external voting rights last year in supplementary fat sheets. To standardize this data set on migrant electoral rights with, uh, for example, uh, the global seed data set on citizenship laws, we also adopt binary and categorical coding. This way, the interpretation is also simple for a broader audience interest in migration, uh, citizenship, and political participation that having complex uh, scale, like numeric uh, scales or thread holes. Rapidly, uh, the coding structure of the data set is, uh, well, has five levels. The first level uh, differentiates between a no citizen residents and no resident citizens. The second level accounts for different levels of election, national, regional, and local elections. Uh, the third level, uh, in turn, distinguish between legislative, executive, and referenda. Uh, we don't cover elections below the municipal uh, level, such as, um, for instance, um, local district election in larger cities or uh, parochial election. Uh, importantly, we only code uh, migrant electoral rights in direct election for uh, legislative and executive elections. The four level splits the right to vote uh, and the right to stand as candidate. The final level, as you can see in this uh, 
this figure uh, capture the eligibility, access, and modality condition. We are not going to uh, dive deeper into this, uh, this, these different conditions, uh, but it's important to take uh, a, uh, a look or uh, um, yeah, a look in this. Uh, as a pattern of local level electoral rights for no citizen residents and no national electoral rights for no resident citizens continue around the world, especially in Europe and in the Americas, we focus on those two in the next uh, slides of our presentation. Um, this is uh, supporting uh, the previous contributions, such as the contribution of uh, Jean Thomas and uh, Reiner here. So uh, to make more dynamic this presentation, hopefully, uh, we choose to uh, show or visualize some maps uh, so we can, we can see uh, which countries has enfranchised their migrants as of 2020 and also candidacy rights. As you can see, uh, several countries already code uh, has a provision for uh, both uh, no resident citizens and no citizen residents, particularly in Europe, as well as in North and South America. The second category with uh, more visibility in is the countries that only extend migrant enfranchisement. In terms of candidacy rights in turn, uh, this situation is more diverse, uh, as you can see. Um, well, in the European Union, candidacy and voting rights are conjoined. Uh, in the Americas, for example, um, these tend to depend on the country. Look, in, look, look at Argentina, for example, or the, 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 diverse, the diverse set of colors that uh, exist in South America. Um, we also zoom in on the Caribbean is quite uh, interesting and diverse in terms of migrant electoral rights. Uh, we only bring uh, this, these two maps just for uh, the inclusive because uh, in the war map is, is a little bit uh, not, uh, you cannot see clearly what happens in the Caribbean. Okay, considering that today we are interested in the link between uh, citizenship and migrant electoral rights, I ask a very descriptive uh, question. What is the association, if any, between uh, citizenship laws and, migrant, and uh, voting rights for no resident citizens? Uh, overall, well, we do uh, some G square because uh, both uh, independent and dependent variable variables are categorical or binary. Uh, overall, the probabilistic connection between the acquisition and loss of citizenship loss uh, with candidacy and voting rights, uh, voting rights and candidacy rights uh, is not significant except for when migrants can renounce a voluntary to their citizenship. I'm going to explain a little bit more uh, later. First, the current scope is uh, 70 countries that considerably are in the region with more expansive migrant electoral rights, uh, Europe and the Americas. Uh, we only quote this and for instance, uh, Australia, uh, Angola and uh, Russia in other um, areas. So uh, we expect that uh, quoting Africa and quoting uh, countries in Asia, we are going to have more interesting results that can uh, bring uh, more interesting explanations than um, the one that I'm going to do today. Uh, I bring some examples just to see uh, how these, uh, these, these variables of citizenship laws with voting rights or candidacy rights are connected. Uh, first, voluntary registration. Uh, 
with uh, no resident citizen electoral rights. Uh, in the left, we have uh, voting rights and in the uh, right, we have candidacy rights. Uh, just to remember, one is significant and the other not. Uh, voting rights uh, is not significant, is not significantly correlated with uh, voluntary re renunciation of citizenship, while candidacy rights is um, uh, significantly correlated with voluntary re renunciation of citizenship. And uh, you, you see, uh, well, we, we, we we draw, we draw here very simple uh, two by two uh, tables with uh, the the three letters of uh, each each country that we code. Um, the first, uh, well, with, while the, the the first table shows the voluntary uh, renunciation versus uh, no resident citizens voting rights and in significant relation. The second illustrates uh, which countries allow uh, or not allow that migrants renounce their citizens voluntary uh, con contingent open uh, migrant candidacy rights. This second association is the only one that is significant, I insist. Uh, to us, this is quite interest as there is, there is an obvious connection, countries that do not allow for voluntary renunciation also do not grant voting rights to no resident citizens, except for three cases that, is, that are uh, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, and Mexico. Maybe Luisi, uh, can talk about why Mexico is in this quadrant. Um, then we have, uh, when referring to other modes of loss of citizenship, uh, for instance, by residing abroad, we look that there is an unbalanced result influencing most likely uh, the association in the Chi square. As you, you can see, most of the countries uh, adopt or has grant uh, migrant electoral rights, while uh, there are few that, um, that do not. So uh, only Jamaica is, for instance, uh, interesting here because uh, uh, despite that there, there are not external voting rights, um, the uh, Jamaica states that uh, the loss of citizenship can uh, can can be affected uh, effective when residing abroad. Uh, a similar situation we can see holds true in the case of the nexus between acquisition of foreign citizenship and a no resident uh, citizens voting rights. Um, and last but not least, uh, I try to combine dual citizenship acceptance uh, uh, combined indicator in the global in the global seed data set of uh, the modes of acquisition and loss of uh, citizenship loss uh, with a no resident citizens uh, voting rights. And there is also no significant uh, relation, most probably because most country in the sample grant, uh, again, external voting rights. And the overall trend is the acceptance of dual citizenship while granting external voting rights. Um, this is all for my part. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing so Claudia can jump in into the, this presentation. Uh, thanks a lot. I am going to switch over. Oh, panelists, okay. So, can you confirm whether you can see my slides? Yes, excellent, okay. So in this part of the presentation, I'm going to focus on non-citizen resident voting rights at the local level. And as Sebastian said, we're focusing on the local level because this is most commonly where non-citizens are granted voting rights. One caveat I should give you at the beginning is uh, that a lot of the, not a lot, but there are a few countries in our data set that have subnational variation. An example would be Switzerland, an example would be the United States, where in some localities, there are voting rights for non-citizens and in others, there are not. Uh, when we had to run our analysis and visualize our data, we had to make some decisions. Uh, and while we capture subnational variation to an extent in our data set, here 
when there is subnational variation in a country, there are some uh, elements that have granted these voting rights, we call it as a positive case. So this should just be a caveat at the beginning when you uh, look at the results. So you know that, for example, the US is coded as a positive case. All right, and with that, I will jump into the main research question. So here we're looking at the association between uh, access to citizenship for immigrants, so naturalization rules, and access to voting rights for non-citizen residents. And you know, there are different models that this uh, association could potentially follow, right? It could be jointly exclusive. So a state could make accessing citizenship as well as voting rights very difficult. Or it could be a jointly inclusive model where you um, make both of them easy to access. It could also be a substitution effect. Uh, a state could say, well, um, citizenship is so hard to acquire and to that leaves a very large democratic deficit. So as a result, uh, as a substitution, we offer, um, I see a chat message. Oh, I see. Um, and so as a substitution for that, local voting rights are granted. It could also go the other way that you could say, oh, we have uh, local voting rights for immigrants. So there's less of a democratic deficit. And so we don't grant uh, citizenship as easily. These are different uh, models that one could see, or there is no association. And uh, I'm now going to jump into a few of these. So my mind finds it a bit easier to process numbers, but I also have the um, state version of this. Um, but I've highlighted here the most restrictive version where there is neither use soli, access to citizenship, nor local voting rights. Uh, as a quick recap, in case there's anyone here who is not familiar with it, use soli citizenship is basically being granted citizenship upon birth and territory of your country. This also includes those cases where that is conditional upon things such as a parent having had previous residence in that country. Uh, and the associate, so basically the countries that have neither use soli nor local voting rights are the most restrictive and the ones that are most inclusive are those that have both. And based on this, we can see there's a little bit of that inclusive restrictive polarization going on. And I can tell you that this um, uh, table, uh, when we analyzed it with chi-square, it did come back as statistically significant at the 5% level. But since this is just a really small snippet of our data set, I wouldn't um, attribute too much uh, to that at this point. Uh, so here we're looking at uh, use soli citizenship and uh, whether local voting rights for non-citizen residents are conditional on having a specific nationality. So what you saw in the previous table was actually not considering voting rights for EU's um, citizens at the local level. So countries like Austria in the previous data set uh, in the previous analysis were considered as negative cases because I'm not considering that there are uh, voting rights for other EU citizens. Here, that is included based on whether um, that is a restriction. So um, the most inclusive quadrant here is the one that, that has use soli and it has local voting rights independent of nationality. And the most exclusive one is over here. There isn't polarization going on to the same extent that we've seen in the previous analysis. Another thing that I would like to look at is how long does it take to become a citizen or how long does it take to um, acquire local voting rights? And our data sets have these informations on, on both of these things. And on average, it takes longer to gain citizenship than to gain uh, local voting rights. Uh, which does seem to suggest that local voting rights might be seen as a substitute, uh, a preparatory step more than, more than a substitute. And um, don't be uh, shocked by this uh, maximum required residence that we observe here in, in Uruguay. That is a true outlier in our data set. Um, here I'm looking at that same information, but broken down uh, on a binary uh, scale. Like, are there any, is there immediate access to local voting rights? Um, and whether the citizenship condition is uh, five years or less. And um, you can see that most countries uh, fall into the quadrant of requiring some residence duration for local voting rights and um, having uh, a low residence requirement for, for citizenship. And uh, the final one, which uh, also brought an interesting result is relating to dual citizenship. So here we're looking at countries that require 
and those who want to become a citizen to renounce their previous citizenship. So there is a, a previous renunciation of the citizenship before, if you want to naturalize, that is the most exclusive quadrant here. And there's also no voting rights. And here, the most inclusive quadrant we can see, uh, it is not required to renounce the previous citizenship and, uh, and there are local voting rights. So there does seem to be an association between um, dual citizenship acceptance and uh, granting local voting rights for non-citizen residents. All of this summarized in one table where you can see that uh, uh, the statistical significance is really only given um, for a subset of what we're looking at, uh, and that is the dual citizenship connection, both whether the EU franchise is included or excluded. And when we look at the basic connection of local voting rights and uh, use solely citizenship access, uh, this only matters once we exclude uh, the EU franchise. In case you wonder why that is the case, um, the EU franchise technically isn't uh, to the same extent in the, in the control of those particular states who are also deciding on their citizenship access rules, which is why we've run the analysis often without um, EU franchise. So to conclude, what you've seen was really a premature snapshot of our data set because we're covering uh, a lot of years, right, from 1960 to 2020, and all you've seen right now is the data for 2020. And we're also only looking at 70 countries at this point. So I would not put too much importance on the findings that we have at this stage because it is preliminary. Uh, we have the longitudinal data as well, and that will allow us to go into much more depth um, when, when the time comes. And another thing that I should say is when you look into the details of each of these countries, you quickly run into uh, obstacles that we should uh, consider when we do a more detailed analysis. For example, some of the countries that do not require prior residence um, for granting local voting rights actually require permanent residency status, which is a de facto residence requirement of some sort. Um, so we have separate variables for that as well in our data set. And um, it, eventually we would need to combine them in some way, but there is no, there's also no standardized way in how long it takes to become a permanent resident in a country. Overall, there is no clear logical association between uh, citizenship loss and acquisition rules and migrant voting rights, but there are some hints in our data set of uh, especially in relation to um, non-citizen uh, residents, that there does seem to be both the restrictive model and the liberal model as two poles that have formed. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. And I will hand over to the rest. Thank you very much, Sebastian and Claudia. Uh, very hard to condense all that work of many months uh, into a short presentation. I hope it was still uh, quite easy to follow. Uh, and now I would really encourage everybody in the audience to add uh, questions uh, to those already uh, asked by Martin in the Q&A function. So while you are thinking about your questions, I will uh, read out the question that Martin has already posed uh, and it's addressed to Sebastian. Uh, but I think it also concerns to a certain extent uh, uh, Claudia. So the question is, there is no significant correlational associations between electoral rights and citizenship laws, but it seems there is a set theoretic association. No voluntary renunciation, is a sufficient condition for having non-resident voting rights. This makes sense as the absence of voluntary renunciation indicates a political will to maintain strong connections with the diaspora, so strong that states don't allow renouncing. Is it plausible that this, it seems plausible that this is also reflected in granting voting from abroad or not? So, do you expect that regime characteristics? That's a further question. Do you expect that regime characteristics? So for example, how democratic a regime is mediate this set theoretic association between uh, electoral rights and citizenship laws. 
so uh, should I, I respond? So oh, sorry. Could, could try to respond to this, Sebastian. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I totally agree with uh, the, the comment of Martin, uh, but as Claudia already indicated, uh, this is a very preliminary uh, results and we only code uh, 70 countries. So I hope that uh, having uh, Africa and Asia, we can have a more clear cut patterns and, uh, and uh, more a uh, clean explanation of uh, the association between voluntary renunciation versus electoral rights. Also, uh, we are only talking about um, the variables of uh, the, 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 the data set on uh, citizen laws, uh, but uh, with uh, the, the data set of uh, migrant electoral rights in 2020. So uh, as we uh, already anticipate in uh, our presentation, uh, we, want, we want to extend this, uh, this, this, this <laughs> correlation, uh, this, well, this, this, this finding with a temporal factor in, in this case, uh, I think um, this is going to be a very um, neat um, explanation. Um, between uh, voluntary renunciation and um, electoral rights. I don't know if you want to complement um, something, Claudia? Uh, I would only uh, respond to Luis's uh, comments on, okay. on the side. That, that uh, I need to read out first, okay. Claudia, because not everybody uh, can access uh, the chat function. So Luis uh, has, uh, I think, two questions. One is, does the data set contain information about the enfranchising authority? So who decides on, uh, on, on, on the franchise is central government uh, legislation uh, or is it a local or regional authority? And uh, secondly, she asks, I think that to compare inclusion of non-citizen residents and non-resident citizens, it would be important to analyze the possible asymmetries any preliminary thoughts on this? So I, I guess with asymmetries, Luisi refers to dual citizenship toleration for outgoing naturalizations, the citizens uh, of a country that acquire foreign citizenship versus dual citizenship toleration for the incoming naturalizations of immigrants who don't have to renounce their previous citizenship. Um, yes, Claudia, go ahead. Should yeah, on the first part about whether we have information about the enfranchising authority. So yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense that we have information about is it the central government or the subnational uh, government that is uh, making these decisions, but no to the extent that we don't have information such as is this by presidential decree or uh, any more detailed information of that extent. That said, uh, our data set will be published together with fact sheets for each country where we uh, link to all the laws and so on. So in a way that information is there, it's just not coded in the data set. Um, then uh, to the second part of your question, yeah, I, I definitely think that um, the asymmetric access to dual citizenship um, is something that needs to be kept in mind. And I think that is why we used slightly different uh, indicators from the access and uh, loss of citizen, as an acquisition and loss of uh, citizenship data set. Um, because uh, for example, I was using the one whether you have to renounce the citizenship of, of your previous country when you want to naturalize in the country that you're in. Uh, if, and for um, Sebastian's part, uh, it was slightly different. Uh, Sebastian, do you want to add something to that? Just that we are we are coding uh, only the enactment of the law, like uh, like um, the constitutions or the the provision in in the electoral code, and not de facto uh, migrant enfranchisement. Maybe if I can add to this, I, Sebastian, I think for your part, for the question of dual citizenship toleration, uh, for the question of voting rights for non-resident citizens and how this relates to dual citizenship toleration, it would be wiser not to take the overall dual citizenship indicator 
but only uh, the toleration of dual citizenship for those who acquire a foreign nationality. Uh, that would make more sense. Uh, so uh, similar as Claudia did when she took only the dual citizenship toleration for immigrants who naturalize in the country, because there it's more plausible that there would be some kind of association with uh, voting rights for the same group. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A or in the chat currently. So uh, Joachim has raised his hand. Joachim, you can pose your question also orally. That's possible, yes? Yeah, indeed, I would uh, prefer uh, to do that. Um, first, thank you for uh, another fascinating uh, data set that we have to look closer at during uh, the upcoming days or weeks or months or whatever. Um, I do not have anything um, to add or to question on the data set. Uh, I started or I was simply um, <clears throat> Or my 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 comment that I would uh, um, would like to to formulate right now was stimulated by your conclusion, yeah, that there are no far no clear logical association emerges, um, with with some minor exceptions, um, um, and then I just happened to uh, stumble across um, the PhD dissertation of my colleague Samuel Schmidt, who might be in the audience today uh, who work, worked on the association of immigration and citizenship uh, um, regulations. Yeah, and here we are now discussing the associations between citizenship and um, electoral uh, regulations. Um, and one of the basic messages of Sam's uh, PhD thesis is that um, there are no easy, simple associations, but you have to go and look to, at the politicization of uh, these issues and, and, and at, at politics in a way. Yeah, and uh, that's uh, my kind of hint of uh, that. Um, I think that we are also here in order to make sense out of uh, the associations or non-associations that we see between uh, citizenship policies and uh, enfranchisement uh, policies. Uh, probably we have to add and include um, aspects in order to make sense of this um, that uh, go beyond uh, the simple um, um, coding of, uh, of uh, laws and regulations. We have, we have to look at, at processes uh, in, uh, in between. Um, and I think from my own research, um, um, I think that there is a similar hypothesis here that um, when the, the, the as Sam has for his association, that when it is politicized, uh, we see higher associations of things uh, in uh, of these uh, two uh, regulatory fields uh, than in when it's not politicized. Uh, and, and we should really think about that there is no logical and necessary uh, um, association between naturalization and citizenship policies and um, the inclusion into the demos, uh, the enfranchisement policies. And I would even say uh, when you look at the national level, um, um, we, you have focused now your analysis more on the subnational level because there is more variance there in many in respect to the immigrants. Um, but um, there I would like, and I'm working on a paper that makes the point uh, that uh, the inclusion of uh, um, um, people on the national level or the expansion of the boundary of the demos on the national level it, uh, should not be only interpreted in respect to migrants, but it has a different uh, logic that is behind uh, that. Yeah, um, It is about kin minorities primarily, and it's also about policy building projects, and it's not uh, easily interpreted and analyzed by looking at uh, migration. Right, thanks. A, a, a very important and substantial comment. Uh, so, Claudia or Sebastian, would either of you want to respond to this? Claudia, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I must say, I was also thinking about Sam's work uh, when, when I was doing this, but it's just much too early for us, given that we haven't. Uh, um, you know, we, we haven't even the longitudinal data for both of the data sets yet uh, to start adding control variables and go into these more nuanced details. So this is just the, the most basic preview that one could potentially come up with. So I, I completely agree with you. It's not the stage for us yet to be able to do that. Um, 
And then uh, Sebastian, you probably want to want to add more. No, just just uh, just insist in in the in the way that uh, the temporal factor plays a, a very very big role in the, uh, the association. And uh, right now, as uh, the global trend is to uh, well, like in two thousand twenty, I don't know right now, right now, but uh, in two thousand twenty uh, was uh, to to extend. Uh, migrant electoral rights, but also uh, citizen dual citizen toleration. So um, uh, having these uh, constraints, uh, we can only have limit uh, limit results, limit significance. Um, but maybe in the eighties or maybe in the seventies, uh, the situation is totally different, and we can find more fine tuned um, uh, relations. Thanks. Uh, I think it's time to conclude this first part of, of the webinar. Let me just add uh, also to Joachim's question that I think this is indeed uh, uh, the more interesting research question to ask. So instead of just assuming that in a large data set, you will find always some kind of associations. And then we can come up with the hypo plausible hypothesis that citizenship uh, access to citizenship and access to voting rights is substitutive. As Claudia pointed out, you know, uh, if you don't do the inclusion on one, you might do the inclusion on the other, or it might be correlative. Uh, it might be positively associated. So countries that are more open on one dimension are also more likely to be open on the other, or more closed on one, more closed on the other. Both of this is plausible. Uh, but uh, if we find no association, then, uh, then indeed what we need to look for is more contingent form of associations and what they are uh, uh, de determined uh, by. And the politicization of the topic is a very likely and good candidate for explaining contingent uh, associations that we find in certain regions, maybe over certain periods uh, of time. And for this, we need a large, uh, longitudinal data set in order to zoom in on these particular associations between the two topics. So I think we have already arrived at the great preliminary conclusion for the empirical part. Now let's move on uh, to the normative part. Or well, let's, let's rather sum up again what is by now, you know, the, the common finding in the literature that has been highlighted again by the data presented by Claudia and Sebastian. Uh, and this is that there are two patterns uh, uh, how democracies react to migration in terms of um, uh, inclusion of migrants. Most countries strengthen the link between citizenship and voting rights by eliminating, sorry, by eliminating a condition of residence in the territory for national elections. At the same time, there is a significant number of countries in Europe and Latin America where the opposite happens at the local level. Residence becomes the only condition for voting rights in these countries, so that the voting rights there are disconnected from national citizenship. Now, for the round table, we want to consider from a perspective of democratic norms, whether and how citizenship and voting rights should be connected at the national level. So let's take the local level for granted, interesting phenomenon, but let's focus on the national level where it's much more controversial. And I'm going to suggest to our three panelists that there are at least three possible positions, normative stances that you might take, and questions that arise once you adopt one of these normative positions. The first one is that citizenship is a necessary and a sufficient condition for national voting rights. Uh, if you are advocate the strong link between citizenship and national voting rights, then the follow-up question is, how inclusive should citizenship laws then be for those living or born inside and outside the territory, since it's the citizenship laws that determine whether or not migrants are included uh, into uh, the demos uh, and can vote. The second position would be, in a way, the opposite one that suggests that citizenship should be replaced by another criteria. And the criteria that is favored by most uh, in these debates is residence. 
so that residence becomes at least a sufficient condition for national voting rights. The question is then, should it also be a necessary condition, meaning that the non-resident citizen should be excluded and the global trend that we've seen over the last 30 years of extending voting rights to the emigrants on the diaspora should be reversed? Is that the price to pay for replacing uh, uh, citizenship with residence as the normative grounding of voting rights? And the third position would be that it could be either the citizenship or residence that are uh, sufficient but not necessary conditions for national voting rights. Uh, if you take that ecumenical position, you might then also advocate other grounds for transnational voting, such as in the interdependence within the Union of States, such as the European Union. Uh, that's the position that I assume Joachim is going to defend, but the question is then, within that position, how can you prevent over-inclusiveness of the demos and how can you maintain some semblance of equality among the members of the demos because they have similar connections to uh, the demos and uh, the political institutions uh, uh, rather than completely different ones. So I'll, I'll leave you with these three questions to reflect on, but feel free also to uh, you know, twist them uh, in a different way. And, and, uh, but uh, I'll let you now uh, start to uh, answer these questions and I'll uh, take the, the, uh, the panel in the following sequence. We'll start with uh, Sandra and then Luisi and then Joachim. And if each of you could uh, briefly introduce your position in no more than five minutes, that would be optimal. Sandra, floor yes, is yours. Yes, thank you. I think um, the debate uh, would profit from a distinction that I'm not sure how to make it in English, but a distinction between Staatsangehörigkeit and Staatsbürgerschaft, which is being a state member, Staatsangehörige and being a, an active citizen in the sense of having a political right. And uh, we are discussing dynamics of uh, decoupling both. And there is an empirical um, dynamic that is um, um, going on, for example, in the European Union, where there is a decoupling of uh, political rights from citizenship um, on the local and EU level, leaving out the national level. Um, and uh, we are looking for reasons why it might be justified to decouple um, this also in a more general um, sense. But um, my uh, argument is that I think it's uh, plausible to um, um, give political rights on the basis of residency without um, taking away uh, national citizenship in the sense of Staatsangehörigkeit, but um, um, yeah, um, justifying um, the exercise of political rights on the basis of um, some kind of um, social membership being um, uh, involved in economically, culturally, socially in a certain uh, society. And then um, on a very basis, basic principle, the justification for inclusion would be that you, you are entitled to, um, to be included in decisions that affect you. And of course, this is a very broad uh, principle, but um, in connection with some idea of social membership, it's, it gives a strong reason why uh, enfranchisement on the basis of, of social membership um, should be uh, justified. Now, um, political rights and in particular um, uh, voting rights on the national level are, are um, particularly controversial uh, because um, of the character of this um, polity. Um, Rainer, for example, has uh, um, made the point that national uh, citizenship has a particular transgeneral uh, generational um, aspect, which makes it uh, a kind of Schicksalsgemeinschaft or a community of, of solidarity. And I guess what is behind this is the bonds of, of solidarity that uh, are institutionalized in some kind of welfare arrangements. And that's why you need a certain um, um, uh, stability of this 
um, group of, of, of members of national uh, citizens. And um, here I'm, I'm um, limiting myself to a statement um, on, on a constellation like the European Union. My argument would be uh, in the sense that um, the European Union is becoming a democratic and solidaristic legal community. Um, um, no, the reasons become less convincing that uh, national citizenship is has this particular character only. So, um, in particular, in the constellation of the European Union, I would argue that uh, the the more the European Union moves towards a, a democratic and solidaristic um, little community, um, we can um, argue that it has the character that Reinhardt attaches to, to national uh, communities only. And the consequence would be um, to include um, EU citizens also on the national level, um, let them vote without naturalizing uh, naturalization. Um, it's a bit inconsistent that the national level is left out, I would argue. And um, of course, it is a statement on the normative level um, it's not saying that the EU is already the kind of legal community that I was describing, but it's on a way to become this, and in, so it's a um, it's a conditional argument. Um, but um, it questions the uh, kind of characterization of certain polit political um, units, like the local level, the national level, the supranational level. Um, um, as having some characteristic that can only be realized on that level. Um, so um, I found it interesting that Claudia said um, that uh, EU rules are, are put in brackets because they, they are not under the control of the member states. That was an interesting statement because uh, that uh, in ideally, I would say, I would describe it differently. I would say the member states have agreed on a reciprocal basis to, to, to grant each other these, uh, 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 the citizens of, of each other's uh, states, the, 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 these rights. Of course, you could argue um, that certain members who uh, came in later just had to accept this um, and they would rather <laughs> not accept this. Uh, that's, that's interesting, but it's, it's, uh, it's um, um, ideally, I, I would reconstruct the, the European Union as a, as a union of states in which this um, is um, agreed on on a reciprocal basis and that it's not just put upon them like um, um, uh, um, from a dominator, but of course that's how the EU is often uh, described. Um, and maybe there is also some sense in it. Um, we can we can debate that. Um, what else can I um, what else can I say? Maybe is is it already five minutes? Yes, it's okay. Been, uh, so yeah, I have another point, but I can make this in the discussion. So I'll, thanks. I'll, ask, I'll give you a chance to say one word, yes or no, to my qu second question. You know, would you advocate that uh, the non-resident uh, citizens are disenfranchised, or would you think that on your principles? Uh, not talking about the EU, but generally, uh, on your principles, they should uh, have still have the right to vote, as they have now in most democracies. <laughs> um, I think I, 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 you, you wanted to push me in this second position, while I was rather, um, uh, I would rather put myself in the in the third camp of the of the third position, which I find the more interesting because it's uh, here voting rights are conditional on citizenship or residence under certain circumstances. But for the sake of the argument, I can also uh, uh, argue for the second position. But um, I think, it, yeah, it's it's uh, the third position is is much more convincing because I would also say that there are of course some conditions for uh, enfranchising um, uh, uh, residents, um, time yes. conditions, but also conditions that come from social membership. No, that's a perfect answer. I don't want to push any of you into any position. <laughs> I just want you to explain your positions. Now thanks. let's move on. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Sandra. Let's move on to Luisi. Thank you, Raina. And first of all, let me 
um, say thank you for this invitation. I am delighted to be part of this discussion and to hear this premiere uh, from preliminary results from the data sets. My warmest congratulations uh, to Sebastian and to Claudia. You did a great job. Even though I have to accept, I have to spend a lot more time studying uh, several of the slides that you presented so quickly this morning. Uh, but it's, it's a pleasure to know that this uh, data set will be out uh, soon. And I want to say also that um, even though we're focusing today again on uh, non-citizen residents and non-resident citizens thinking mostly about uh, migrants, as Joachim said before and Claudia agreed, um, slowly we're moving towards our, the rea realization that this is not only the this is not the only relevant group, right? So I think that um, as much as we um, value the, the current uh, progress with the data set production and what you presented is absolutely uh, progress, um, I think we, we have to start thinking of uh, how can we go beyond the categories of resident and uh, citizen to think of a meaningful political engagement. And uh, today, I think we're, we're um, not only challenged by recent research uh, on Africa, you know, uh, the, the work, recent work by Bronwyn Mambi has uh, challenged us all to uh, see the challenges beyond migration to, to the exercise and recognition of citizenship in, in some regions. So um, I want to acknowledge that kind of challenge. And uh, there are also other challenges today and ahead that compel us to think about what binds people locally, uh, transnationally and globally, you know? And, and these issues sometimes transcend uh, migration. Uh, it, very urgent issues today that, that compel us to think about these are rising polarization in societies, you know, the aggressive wars, uh, that we are observing the pandemic also and how this affected mobility of people um, uh, even internally, uh, processes of, you know, um, anomie, loneliness and uh, entfremdung. So I'm thinking about these very large challenges ahead of us. Uh, even though I am working on these particular issues myself, I'm very, very happy to, to see progress in this. I think that we are challenged to, to, to start enlarging our uh, preoccupations, the, the issues that we care about and that we connect to political participation. So coming to uh, the, the questions raised by Raina, um, I have to say that um, even though I'm very happy to jo be joining this panel from Mexico in a completely different time zone than the rest of you, uh, I only saw your very mind-binding uh, questions, Raina, uh, this morning, so like 15 minutes before joining the, the panel, but I will try to uh, address this, these questions as, as best as I can. And the first thing I have to say is that I approach these issues, uh, as you know, rather from an empirical side. Um, and even though I have always made clear that, that I have a normative preoccupation and also latently at least, or not very explicitly, but there is in my book a, a normative position, um, my, my approach to these issues is, is empirically. Um, another warning is that I completely agree with Sandra Soibat um, and, and her admonition that we should rather try to uh, differentiate between citizenship and nationality. This is what I try to do in my book. So sometimes the questions that pose relations of voting rights and citizenship for me are especially mind bind, uh, bending because I don't necessarily equate citizenship with nationality. Um, so uh, what I want to say is uh, very briefly in the minute that I have left because I spent too much uh, worrying about global issues already is that um, I think that uh, citizenship acquisition norms and citizen retention norms and the relation to both voting rights are very sensitive to the development of political commitments. And I think this is reflected in my book that um, I, I stated uh, many times that I take a process perspective on political engagement. 
And this process pers pers perspective also colors or filters my response to your questions, Rainer. I think that uh, people uh, should have the freedom to choose where to commit and where to participate. But also the political uh, communities that are trying to find uh, an acceptable governance and acceptable principles of inclusions should have also the freedom to decide uh, some prerequisites for that sort of commitment that make sense and that are compatible with liberal uh, principles. So I am very skeptical that birthright, for example, that you solely decides, decides the whole story about uh, voting rights. I think uh, it gives you some rights, but it does not, and it should not decide your political participation rights for a lifetime. So my process pr perspective is both sensitive to the processes needed politically, to the kind of units that politically are able to decide. This is why I asked before about the enfranchising authorities. We don't always have the same enfranchising authorities. Not all nation states are the same, but my process perspective also refers to the individual. Individuals might change their allegiances, their commitments over time. And a proper uh, consideration of when and how to include them in both the, the state of reception and the state of origin should be sensitive to the development and to the change of those political commitments over time. So I have more issues on, on the, on the multi-level citizenship um, thought and the, the possible matryoshka feeling uh, that, that we get in this the easy differentiation between local and national, but I leave that for the debate. Thanks, Luisi. Let me do the same thing to you as I did to Sandra, which is to try to be provocative with one short question following up on what you just said. Would you then be in favor, if you emphasize individual choice, that everybody should get a quota of votes that he or she can cast in a national election where she chooses? Would that express your emphasis on the individual and the right to choose. Does, well, that, does that necessarily uh, mean that this is uh, an either or relationship in, in one polity or the other? Well, if you have five votes, you can cast three in one country and two in the other. I think that I would agree to this kind of uh, flexible uh, um, position. Okay, great. I know you. I, I, I muted myself too early. Joachim, it's, the floor is yours anyhow. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rainer, would it be possible uh, that you give me the opportunity that I share my screen? This, this is for Valentina uh, to uh, allow you to share the screen. <clears throat> yes, just a moment. I think all panelists already can share the screen. Ah, okay, then I simply try. Yes, yes, I confirm you should have uh, the possibility. Do you say, see my, my, my table? Yeah, because I would like to use my five minutes that I have as an introductory statement uh, to explain my position um, on the basis of uh, a manuscript uh, that uh, will come out in uh, democratization in a few weeks. Um, where this table is, uh, uh, is part of, um, of, uh, of it. Well, because I, uh, indeed, of course, uh, uh, starting with Weiner's questions, uh, those who are familiar with my work uh, are sure, like he is, that I'm, um, I'm opting for uh, that um, citizenship or residence uh, should be uh, sufficient, but not necessary conditions, but it's I uh, doing my reasoning on these um, things, three important things um, um, came up and I dealt with them uh, uh, stronger. First, the first thing is um, you cannot discuss anything about expansion of the electorate uh, towards non-resident citizens or towards non-citizen residents without taking into account at the same time uh, the relevance and the acceptance of dual citizenship. 
Yeah, but because in, especially in normative, and I will make clear with this uh, table uh, that makes um, a, a difference uh, in normative uh, uh, discussions. Second, um, indeed, I when I, I was proposing um, um, multiple voting rights, especially for dual citizens, I was not taking too much um, serious the questions of political equality. I thought more about political equality the last three years. And, and that is my main point. If in all, uh, in all reflections on this topic, I'm not a migration scholar. I'm a political theorist and democracy scholar. I think about the consequences for uh, political systems and, and democracy when I think about this. And here in this table, I have uh, presented um, the four potential options that are available when you think about whether a non-national resident should be enfranchised or and when you think about and uh, whether non-resident nationals should be enfranchised. Um, and then you have four options, uh, the inclusive regime, yeah, that it uh, uh, accepts both inclus uh, inclusations, um, um, the national regime that is open for including the non-resident nationals, but not the, the non-national um, residents. Um, the uh, territorial regime is those uh, who emphasize residency and want to include the non-resident, uh, the non-national residents, but not the non-national uh, the non-resident nationals and the exclusive regime. And in this uh, table, you find um, not only the, the, the definitions that also Reiner uses now in his question, necessary and sufficient conditions, but then you see the, the arrows, the pointing to what it means for the system and then what it means for equality. The first arrow in every, in every um, um, quarter is uh, what it means for the system. Yeah, an inclusive regime means you have overlapping demoi. Uh, then if you implement this on in various uh, countries on the national level, for example, uh, when you have an inclusive regime, when you have a national regime, you have a system of deterritorialized uh, demoi. Um, and we, when you implement uh, the territorial regime, you have a system of post-national demoi. Not deterritorialization and post-nationalization is already the terminologies that Rainer and Jean-Thomas Arrighi uh, uh, used for in their famous article when they uh, let, uh, laid out the trends on the national and the, the local level. Uh, but here, clearly more uh, uh, strongly uh, compared are the other ones. The exclusive regime, you have a system of insular demoi. And um, here, of course, I develop my main argument for why I'm uh, why I think that we should um, see the expansions of demoi that are taking place primarily through the recognition of dual citizenship across the world, and only secondarily by including non-resident nationals and non-resident. Uh, non-resident nationals and non-national residents, um, then um, it's, it's my main uh, reflections in what does it mean for how the nation, the world is uh, a kind of um, organized, structured uh, in the, along, among the democracies at least. Yeah? And uh, my main argumentation that I have presented a few times is that we should uh, take these developments in order then to constitutionalize and not just see this as a non-intended side effect as it currently is. Uh, for democratizing uh, uh, um, intergovernmentalist organizations like the European Union and other forms of inter-democratic cooperation. But my main and my last uh, point here is I got more aware of these equality issues the last few uh, years. And whereas uh, Rainer and myself, uh, 10 years ago, in our first publications, with, we kind of I would say we already um, almost dismissed uh, the problem of uh, equality uh, when we discussed um, the opportunities of dual citizens to vote in, in various countries then, because we said um, they, when they are uh, suggested, uh, subjected to the law in various countries, they have, should have a right to, to vote in various countries. But we have now the situation um, that uh, these countries are collaborating 
yeah, and, and especially uh, um, citizens in in uh, uh, in the European Union, if they would have the, the right to vote in uh, two national elections, they would uh, have the right to determine uh, two national governments, two national positions, whereas uh, single citizens uh, do not have the right. This kind of entry point uh, was the starting point to think about what it means now for these kind of regimes. And uh, in the second arrows in all four quarters, uh, uh, points to the logical consequences of these four regimes when you take into account not only these developments, but also uh, the existence of dual citizenship. So uh, the, the, the most um, unproblematic way is the territorial regime. Yeah, because you have then a, a single vote for mobile, multiple and sedentary citizens. Mm. But, uh, and you would assume that might be the same for the national regime. No, but that's, that's uh, true for that you have a single vote for sedentary and mobile citizens, but uh, you still have the multiple vote for multiple citizens. Um, so as soon as you take into account the, the parallel developments of these expansions, it's not anymore uh, from a normative point so easy to support the nationalist or the national regime. Um, but um, also, the others uh, problem have some prob problems. Uh, the in insular, uh, uh, the exclusive regime, of course, uh, excludes uh, the mobile citizens, um, and therefore is problematic. But uh, the the regime that I am supporting in general is uh, also problematic from an equality perspective because you have multiple votes for mobile and multiple citizens, but only single votes for sedentary citizens. And uh, this is another reason why I think. Um, that uh, democracies have to constitutionalize these things together in a joint kind of like an European decision making uh, system of, um, of uh, who, which citizens have the right to vote in uh, which countries. And then comes, of course, still uh, my proposal um, that they should do this on the, on the basis of reciprocity um, and those uh, who, uh, countries who allow citizens of other countries to vote in their elections uh, should have the right in these other countries as well. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Joachim. Uh, I, I realize it's a challenge to present a very elaborate proposal in, uh, well, seven minutes. <laughs> Uh, uh, but uh, I think this is really good stuff for debate. Now, uh, I'm, I'm, of course, tempted to uh, raise further questions, but for also to you, but for the sake of time, I will not do this. I will rather invite the other panelists, and that includes, of course, Claudia and Sebastian, uh, to address each other, you know, to uh, especially with critical questions and comments. Uh, and uh, I'm also waiting for more people in the audience uh, to write up questions in the Q&A that I will then read out and uh, address to the panelists. So who wants, uh, Claudia? Yeah, no, I, I just want to respond, lest I be put in the corner, I live in the UK, um, where, where it's um, the EU dominates and dictates everything. Um, that is not... Um, that is not the reason why I think we should analyze empirically the EU franchise differently from other types of franchise. But I think for a government to take the decision, for example, whether to grant the right to vote as part of EU accession or to grant the right to vote on itself, those are two very different decisions. And I think empirically, when we study this topic, there are different factors that shape these decisions. Um, so differentiate by differentiating the, by differentiating the two of them, um, I, I don't want to support the EU dominates everything kind of narrative. That's definitely not the goal, but it's just a, that empirically, these are very different decisions. Thank, thank you. Let, let me just back this up with uh, the further argument that nationality laws are generally outside the competence of EU law. So if you want to compare what countries decide in matters of nationality law and what they decide in terms of enfranchising uh, migrants, then you would be comparing very different things if you include the EU uh, level uh, franchise that is uh, regulated under EU law and the national level uh, legislation on uh, citizenship laws. 
that that's I think a further reason why it's good to keep the two things apart. But apart from this, you know, we have so many interesting normative uh, proposals and uh, issues now on the table. Uh, so I hope there will be somebody willing to, uh, you know, uh, enter the arena and uh, also uh, discuss this in a critical way. I have a, a, a question for Joachim and maybe for you also, Raina, because Joachim uh, said that, that you would have uh, perhaps the same position about his preferred option of um, allowing multiple citizenship. And um, he sees a problem here normatively because uh, these persons would have votes for uh, several polities at the same time for, for, uh, at the national level. Why do you think that this is a problem? Are you, are you assuming that this uh, dual citizenship um, constitutes a privilege then? Because we're not speaking about the same polity, we're speaking about different polities. So this person does not have more votes in the same polity than the single citizens of those polities, right? And I'm also thinking about how do we um, think a bit more uh, realistically about, about these political rights and their reach and also their interconnection to other citizen rights? So we tend to think, and I, I am also to blame for this in my book, uh, we, we tend to think of uh, electoral rights as, as the, you know, par, par excellence of uh, citizen rights, obviously, right, as the pinnacle of all citizen rights, but they're not only the, the only ones, obviously, we have social rights, civil rights, economic rights, and if you look at these compounds of rights, and how these compounds of rights are affected by migrants who, who try to be, uh, to lead, lead transnational lives, to have uh, simultaneously commitments in different communities. Uh, I think my, my hunch, I, I need to back up this better with data, but this comes from my own individual experience and I'm sure <laughs> it resonates with some of you. My, my, uh, my feeling here, my hunch is that there, this is not necessarily a privilege always in, in, in terms of these compounds of rights. So my social rights have been very diminished by my decision to return to Mexico, for example. The uh, things that I have uh, invested into by living in the EU are, are gone, you know? So in, if you think a, a bit more generally in terms of citizenship rights, does, does that assumption hold that you are uh, getting a privilege by having more than one citizenship? I know, for example, very well that a, a, a two passports open more doors than one, of course, you know, and the protection of states. And there are some rules of how you may or may not use strategically these memberships. But I just want to uh, provoke you a little bit with this. Joachim, I'm sure you want to reply. Yeah, my, my answer to this is, has should be understood as partly empirical and partly normative. Um, I think indeed that uh, dual citizens or migrants, um, which are in the situation of being a, in a country where uh, are, are having a, a nationality where they can vote as non-residents and be, uh, being residents in a country where they can vote as residents, um, in a way, have a privilege. I will. I will defend my normative problem uh, problematization right now in a second. But my main argument is that it might be perceived and and politicized as a privilege. And you should really uh, think about uh, the the huge debate that is going on in the populism uh, research uh, between what what the uh, um, good 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 what's his name uh, the the anywheres and the somewheres. Yeah, there is this big cleavage now, uh, which is absolutely strong in, in mobilizing populist reactions uh, that uh, there are um, um, populism, uh, populist uh, um, speakers claim that uh, there is a, 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 a cosmopolitan elite and they usually equate it with mobile people. 
um, that has privileges. And I think it, it's rather easy um, to um, uh, substantiate this uh, claim uh, by and, and ignoring the problems that my, uh, mobile or people or migrants have. Because of course, when in the overall picture, I would say um, indeed, um, there are so many problems that they have though that a little bit of privilege in, in other respects is nothing else than justified balancing uh, of it. But there are two uh, arguments why I think um, the populists could use, and there is a problem, especially in because you make you strength you stress the argument that they vote in different polities in different nation states, but especially in the European Union, but also in other contexts, we policy making is not uh, limited anymore in within within nation states especially in the European Union, the European Council is the most important uh, uh, organ, uh, I would say, and there, there is uh, the national governments yeah, uh, who are with, uh, uh, responsible there. And it's for me clear that people who have a, a vote, and actually we had a very, very prominent example in, in uh, once in referring to the European election, when the chef redacteur that side, uh, 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 um, told the people that he voted in Italy and he voted in Germany for the European elections. And of course, that everybody realized that is, that is incredible and that how, how naive could he be to, 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 to tell them. But I would say it's even when you, when you really understood the European Union correctly, you should see it's not a problem only in the European Parliament when you have two votes. It's also a, a problem in the European Council when you have two votes. So there is an objective problem of inequality in all contexts in which intergovernmentalist uh, uh, decision making plays an important role, and that is quite a lot nowadays. Yeah, and then there is uh, this uh, this uh, uh, idea of that, uh, and that is my main argumentation. That is my what we, uh, I would want to say. Uh, to stick to that because that shows how I always think about it. It's not about only citizenship or migration. It's about always about the structures of governance uh, that uh, that are, are involved. Thanks, uh, Joachim. I I've now received a question through the chat from Peter Spiro. I've seen that Luisa has raised her hand again, but I think I now like to give the the, the floor to Peter by reading out his question. Along the lines of Lewis's questions, what about other forms of political participation? In the US, for instance, through permanent residents, so permanent residents can't vote in national elections, they can donate money to candidates for national office in the same way citizens can. Is any empirical work being done in this direction? How might it impact the normative analysis? Anybody knows about uh, empirical work and uh, dares to come up with normative conclusions whether uh, people who cannot vote uh, might still have political doubt and influence and whether they should have this, for example, through donations? It's uh, a very so interesting observation. Yeah, I think um, it's uh, because you, I wanted to add this anyway, that uh, a citizen-centered perspective, which I um, uh, think is implied in, in Luisa, uh, Lucy's uh, position and a state-centered perspective, which is more implied in, in, in your argument, um, a, a clash a bit here and um, in, in, the, in the European Union. Um, it, it is very interesting that you are able to donate money to parties in another country. I only realized that when the Greens in Germany got a huge amount of money from, from a Netherlands donator from the Netherlands. Um, but you cannot uh, um, uh, uh, found uh, uh, parties, uh, in European parties. So that is strange. And you have a European citizenship status, which is very, very reduced, very limited. But uh, here you have um, a great uh, privilege of someone who, who donates money and uses um, political influence beyond voting. Um, and it's it's something we should really have uh, uh, in mind and should think about uh, more. But um, uh, yeah, to the extent that you pushed uh, Luisa in, a, in an individualistic perspective, 
position also with your question, I just wanted to say that I, I really regard it as an important shift. Uh, I don't know if I interpret it correctly, but to move from the state perspective to the individual perspective um, and the idea that the individual somehow chooses where to put her, uh, decide where is her center or, uh, of life. And that this should be something that should be taken into account more and not be just um, put to the margins if you have such a strong state-centered perspective on it. Thanks. Thanks. And now I'll give the floor back to Luisi. Uh, Yes, thank you, uh, Raina. I just uh, replied to Peter also in the question and answer, but I wanted to come back to um, Joachim's uh, reply to me, which I find uh, perfectly plausible, especially from a European Union uh, perspective or a perspective that is very concerned with this kind of uh, specific political animal. Uh, but uh, let me speak to you from the perspective across the Atl Atlantic. And uh, being currently in a country that also coming back to Sebastian's question to me in his presentation, whether I could say something about why Mexico doesn't allow people to renounce their citizenship. Well, this uh, leads me also to another very dear colleague of, of um, ours, who is also a, a contributor of Global Seed Enio Hoyos research on uh, the uh, actually the, the disadvantages of being a dual citizen in Mexico. You know, in this country, being a dual citizenship means I have less political rights than mononation, mononationals, than people who were born in Mexico and only have that nationality. So this asymmetry plays out in, in very interesting configurations. I, as a Mexican by birth, may acquire a second nationality, but by becoming a second nationality, my political rights here will be diminished, will never be the same as those of mononationals. And this is a, a, a step down in the ladder of differentiations, you know, of, of provisions that hurt the principle of political equality. Uh, even below me are, of course, naturalized Mexicans, who are not dual nationals because they're not allowed to keep their nationality of origin and they will never ever have the same rights of Mexicans by origin. So this is also to tell you this idea, assumption that a dual citizenship necessarily uh, prove, uh, means a privilege and an additive relation of more rights in more communities is not necessarily so. Thanks a lot, Luisi. I think it's time to wrap up since we have only uh, three minutes to go. So let me try to throw in some last minute comments to these very interesting perspectives that have been raised. Uh, starting with uh, Sandra's very uh, perceptive framing of the debate that we have been having here between a, a statist perspective and an individualistic uh, perspective. Uh, in my own view, uh, that's a wrong contrast. Whenever you discuss matters of citizenship and uh, uh, voting rights, you should understand that this is a relational uh, matter. Citizenship doesn't make sense as an individual possession, like uh, possessing you know, property. Uh, it makes only sense uh, as uh, a relation of membership to other citizens and to the institutions of a state that uh, you know, has uh, government institutions to which all are subjected in which citizens can also put, uh, participate. Outside of that, if you think of citizenship as a tradable commodity, uh, as some people do, that, uh, should be, that people should be able to sell on the global market, then it loses its, its value. It's no longer citizenship. It's about something else. It's about tradable mobility rights maybe. But certainly it's completely impossible to think of this as also operating for voting rights as a tradable commodity. Voting rights are the rights that connect an individual as a participating member to a larger community in which that vote generates a government that is accountable to the same people who vote for it. Uh, so we should uh, always think about our principles. How can we combine the individual interests and freedom 
in these matters, or including the possibility to choose for migrants who are positioned between two different countries, with uh, the need for the country to be working as a democracy to, uh, so that everybody can see uh, each other as equals among the citizens and as participating in the democratic government. This is why I think you know there is no real contrast here, but you need to combine the two perspectives. My second comment is on dual citizenship. I found it very interesting that Joachim pointed out that de facto we have seen a simultaneous enfranchisement of immigrants and immigrants through the toleration of dual citizenship, which uh, with the spread of the uh, non-territorial uh, franchise for non-residents you know, makes it possible for them to cast their votes both in their countries of origin and in their uh, countries of residence if they have both citizenships. Uh, this is indeed much more promising and likely to spread uh, the possibility of the inclusive model around the world than uh, the pursuing the pathway of only the five countries that have so far introduced uh, voting rights for non-citizen uh, uh, residents also at the national level. However, as Joachim points out, uh, there are debates that we still haven't seen about uh, this being an unjustified privilege. And I think on the normative perspective, indeed, the question is when countries are independent, that can be easily rejected. There are separate elections. But when countries are interdependent, then you know the privilege of voting twice on the same issues that are discussed and debated by two countries becomes an unjustifiable privilege. And one answer to that might be to think of the second vote of dual citizens as being dormant, that they shouldn't activate it while they are in one country, they should vote only in the country where they are. That would be one possibility, just like uh, uh, in, in many ways, you know, Latin American countries and Spain have uh, concluded, concluded conventions on the dormancy of uh, the, the external citizenship as a condition for tolerating uh, dual citizenship. Let me conclude uh, finally with a pessimistic note. I think one of the possible effects of uh, the, the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine is that we are going to see more backlashes against dual citizenship toleration in the future. Already in the past, Ukraine and the Baltic states were intolerant of dual citizenship because they were afraid of Russian policies of passportization of its territorial claims by handing out Russian passports, first in Georgia, now also in Crimea, in, in the Donbass region, in Transnistria, et cetera. If countries are afraid that other countries might attack them under the pretext that uh, there are large numbers of their own citizens in those countries, then countries will be less inclined to tolerate dual citizenship. So we might see apart from, from the normative concerns that we've talked about also historically a shift uh, of a possibility of reversing that uh, increasing trend towards toleration of dual citizenship that Martin Fink uh, and others have documented so well. Uh, on this rather sober and pessimistic note, I would like to thank again all the panelists for fantastic contributions. Um, and uh, I hope to see you around at the next uh, Global Citizenship Webinar.